you guys doing today? Oh, you guys are actually doing really good. That's good. Okay, so um, <laughs> my name is Ronaldo. If I haven't met you before, um, I get to serve on staff here with our student ministry as well as our media department. Um, today, we're going to be continuing in our series called Changed. It's in week two. And usually when people are like not usual speakers on Sundays or their guests or whatever, they usually present like pictures of like their, their kids or their wife or whatever. I have neither one of those two yet. So here's a picture of my niece because I have a niece. She's great. And so this is my niece. She's amazing. It's my favorite human. It's, that's very true. And so this week recently, we actually got her her first brand collaboration. It's been an amazing time. I'm very excited. She lives in the gated community, so we're trying to get us a little bit somewhere safer. Um, and so that, that's going to help out a lot. I'm really excited about that. There she goes right there. Oh, my gosh. Wow, she's amazing. Wow. <laughs> well, anyways, um, we're going to continue in the series today. And so I'm going to pray, and then we'll get right into it. Uh, King Jesus, thank you for you. Um, and thank you for just the opportunity to talk about you and who you are and who you have been in our lives. Um, Lord, and the things that you were going to do in our lives, um, that you have done and that you will continue to do. Lord, thank you for you and for being consistent in our lives. That's in your name that I pray. Amen. Now, why the cross? So there's a couple articles that describe the cross as this. That they say that men's cross necklaces are extremely popular today for good reason. That they're good looking and they're trendy. That they present somebody's beliefs. That they show that somebody has faith, provide comfort. They present awareness. For other people, they believe that the cross protects them from their enemies or from perils or different things like that. A cross tattoo can also be a symbol of somebody that in your family that has passed away. And so over the years, the cross has begun to change in meaning for different people throughout history. But even now until today, 2,000 years later, we still talk about it. And so today my hope is to walk us through why we still talk about the cross today and what the actual meaning of it is and walk through all of the, the things that happened at the cross where Jesus died. And so if you open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, we're going to begin there in verse 32. And if you don't have your Bible, the verse is going to be up here as well as in the Bible app on our event. And so we begin in verse 32. This is the reading of God's word. Amen. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others, let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They, be, they came offering him sour wine and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God? Since you're going, undergoing the same punishment. We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise. That is the reading of God's word. And so the words spoken by Jesus in John chapter 3, he's speaking to Nicodemus, and he says that the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And so we start there, that in the chaos, Jesus was lifted up. We see the first thing that Jesus does after being put up on the cross, he does what he prays. He prays for the same people that just put him up on the cross. He prays for the same people that are causing all of this chaos and commotion, the same people that are hurling insults at him, the same people that are hating him in this very moment. What is he doing? He's praying for them. That's the first thing that we read. And so for Jesus... This had to be a moment of nothing but humility. 
This had to be a moment where he's like, you know what? I can defend myself. I can do X, Y, and Z. But my words are coming to pass now. This was no accident that he was being lifted up. And so we see a couple of things happening in the midst of him being lifted up. The first thing is the soldiers, I'm guessing that they're bored or whatever. They're here casting lots for his clothes. And if you're a real one, you know, casting lots now is kind of just like shooting dice. And so they're shooting dice. If you're not a real one, they're just flipping a coin. They're just doing these things for Jesus' clothes. And what they're going to do with them, I have no idea. They're probably going to burn them or use them for rags or whatever it may be. But the imagery there for me, as I sat there and, and I read this, was that there was people playing a game. And in the back, the Messiah, Jesus Christ was there dying on a cross and praying for them. As they're sitting here playing a game for his clothes, they're not concerned about him. They're not worried about him. But he's there, sitting there praying. And so what we see here is a lack of concern for who he is and who he said he is. But in the midst of the chaos, Jesus was lifted up. And so the next thing that we see are the leaders. And these are the religious leaders that could have been the scribes or the elders or some of the chief priests or the high priests. And these are the people that are telling him, hey, if, if you are really who you say you are, save yourself. If you're the Messiah, if you're the chosen one, go ahead and save yourself. And everything that they were saying is extremely ironic, but because what they were saying, if you're actually righteous, you're going to get through this. Why? Because the Jewish people at that time believed that God helped the righteous. And so for them, they're saying, you know what? If you're really righteous, as righteous as you say you are, go ahead and save yourself. You're going to get out of this. And that's ironic because what does he do later? We'll get to it. And so they're trying hard continuously to disprove who he says he is, to disprove what he's already told them time and time and time again. He's just here to establish his kingdom, right, because he's the true king. But for them, they're like, nah, man, go ahead, save yourself. Get yourself out of this one. And so the very people, these, these religious leaders, the very people that are there at the temples, trying to be an example of what a godly life looks like, telling people about the Messiah that is to come, these are the very people that are responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. These people, why they wanted to do this? Well, I believe that it's out of their own pride and selfishness and the beef that they had with Jesus. Because for them, they had all the influence, they had the platforms, they had the followers, they had everything that they wanted. But for Jesus to come and to wreck all this religion that they had, that was a threat to them. That was an extremely big threat to them because they didn't want to lose it all. And so what better way to get rid of your threat than just to put him on a cross and accuse him of the very thing that he really is? And so the next thing that we see is the soldiers, they're still walling out. I, don't, I really don't get these guys. But they're here now offering a sour wine to Jesus. And this specific wine that they were giving to him was wine that was extremely dry and that was given to poor people. And so, again, the compassion for Jesus was not there. It was non-existent. Anything that they tried to show that there was actual compassion was fake. It was all facade. Right? It was all mockery. It was all insults going at Jesus. And so as they were still doing these things, in the midst of all this chaos, the Son of Man, again, was being lifted up. They might have been mocking all the things that he said that he was, but he was being lifted up. And so one of the most ironic things about this was there, there was an inscription over Jesus on the cross that said, this is the king of the Jews. And so these people, they thought it was a bright idea to put that, not knowing this is exactly who he was. That this is exactly the man that came to save, to, that came to establish his kingdom here, and that this was actually the king of the Jews. While they were mocking and insulting him, what was he doing? He was sitting there praying. Because he knows what's next to come. He knows that he's actually the king of the Jews. 
And so these words spoken by Jesus in John chapter 3, that the Son of Man has to be lifted up was not on accident. And the fact that he was being lifted up on a cross was not on accident. And the fact that there was an inscription that said, this is the king of the Jews, for them, it might have just been ironic. It might have just been a mockery or whatever it may be. But for those that actually believed, they knew that that was true, that that is our savior up on a cross. And that even though in the midst of all of this chaos, the son of man was being lifted up, Jesus was being lifted up in his rightful place. And soon after, he was going to take his rightful place on the throne as the king of kings. And so we continue in verse, in verse 39. We begin here, and it says this. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so the next word is that in spite of all the insults that are still coming towards him, Jesus was at work. We see here, again, more insults, and this time it's not the soldiers, it's not the religious leaders, not the people standing by. It's on a person on a cross next to Jesus, suffering the same fate as Jesus, death. And so you know how crazy, oh man, this is crazy. So you know how crazy it is to be on a cross next to another person on a cross and you're the guilty one, and you're saying, no, 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 you trash. Like, that doesn't, I don't know. For me, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But also, you know how hard it is to insult somebody, to talk, to breathe while you're on a cross. So what they do, what they did, they, they put you on a cross, and they put nails through your wrist. And through your wrist, they hit a nerve to where your hands are paralyzed. And so you're already in pain. And the only thing that you can do to breathe is you go up like this. And then as soon as you come down, that's when you exhale. And so what this thief was doing he was spending the last hour, minutes, whatever it was, of his little bit of energy that he had to insult Jesus. That's a real hater. Like, he, nah, he's a hater. And so he was going up like this, going down, insulting Jesus. Instead of using your last minutes to do something meaningful, to do something useful, he was like, you know what? I'm going to hate on this guy. And so when I tell you that Jesus had haters, he really had haters. He had people about to die that were like, you know what, let me hit on this guy. He had people that spend their lives studying the word of God, and they're like, you know what, I'm going to hit on this guy instead. Instead of telling people about God, I'm going to spend my time hating on this guy. And so all the while he's there on the cross, more insults are going towards him. But because of who Jesus is and his nature, his work did not stop. Him establishing his kingdom did not stop. And we see here, and it begins in verse 42, or verse 42, it says here that then he said, Jesus, remember me when you came, when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I tell you today, today you will be with me in paradise. In spite of all these insults, Jesus knew he still had some work to do. In spite of all these insults, he still had another miracle left. And so this man on the cross see this, sees the sufficiency of Christ. He saw, you know what? I'm a sinful person. I cannot save myself. I'm the one that got myself here. I don't know how much time I have left, but what I'm going to do with this time is I'm going to admit that he's the king. I don't know where his kingdom is at. I don't know what he's about. But it seems to me that he's different. And so if this is the king of the Jews, I'm going to proclaim it. Please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus, being exactly who he is, his grace covers this man's sins. And he sees him, not for what he's done, 
in spite of his track record, in spite of his wrongdoings, in spite of people seeing him as nothing more than a thief, Jesus sees him and he reassures him and he says, today you're going to be with me. You're going to come with me. Not that he earned it. This man did not deserve it. Nothing. But only by the grace of God was he saved. He didn't do anything right in his life, it seemed like, right? But the only thing he had to do was just surrender and proclaim that Jesus was the king. And so this man desperately saw his need, and it is this encounter with Jesus that changes the trajectory of his life and of his eternity. It is this encounter that shows the goodness of God and it shows the power of God, even on a cross, even in the midst of the chaos, even amongst all the insults that Jesus was still at work. It was this encounter that changed everything for this man. It is this encounter and the moments that lead after this that changes everything for us as well. And so even while Jesus is suffering, He's not defending himself. He's not insulting other people. He's not rebuking anybody. What is he doing? He's saving. That is him still at work. And so he was doing what only he could do, save sinners. And so there's a quick spoiler alert. After this, Jesus dies on the cross. And so for some of y'all, that's like, okay, bet we've already heard that. But for others, others of you, this could be a shock to you. And you could be like, okay, like, what's the big deal? Why are we still talking about this? Because there are people in this room today that have believed or still believe now that the only thing that matters about you is your sin that still believe today that your identity is in your sin, that you're, you believe the lie that you're only a thief or a cheater or a liar or an addict or that you're worthless or you're meaningless, that your life has zero meaning, and you believe the lie that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for you specifically. There are people here that believe that lie, that you know what, okay, he might have died for all these other people, but me, I'm, I'm a little bit too far gone. I'm a little outside of grace. And so I'm here to tell you that Jesus died for you. He proved that on the cross. Right, and we talked about in verses um, 14 and 15 of John 3, we already talked about how he was lifted up. But in verse 16, it says, everybody knows this one, right? John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. But get this, in verse 17, Verse 17, it says, it says this, that God did not send his son, Jesus, into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him, being Jesus. That he did not come to condemn. He proved that on the cross. If there was any time for him to condemn people, it was there. But what did he do? He saved. That's what he came here for, to save us, to save sinners, and yes, absolutely, we, we, need to, we need to live a life that's worthy of our calling. Absolutely, he's going to deal with our sin. But first and foremost, he came to save you. He did not come to condemn. And so I don't know about you, but for me, that's good news. <laughs> he came to save me because I can't save myself. I can't do it. That's not me. And so why the cross? Because the Son of Man had to be lifted up. Right? He had to be lifted up. But why did he have to die on the cross? So that one day he can take people like you and me, whenever we say yes to him, and he says, today, man, at some point you're going to be with me in paradise. At some point you are going to be with me forever. And that he can take us that one day he's going to wipe away every single tear from your eye. And that crying will be no more, grief will be no more, pain will be no more, suffering will be no more. None of these things will be, they will pass away. That the king of king and the lord of lord has come here to establish his kingdom. And he's going to wipe away everything and make all things new. That's what he came here to do. 
And so until then, until we get to that other side of eternity, all you have to do is just say yes. All you have to do is believe that he died on the cross for you. You have to believe that when we could do nothing, Jesus accomplished everything. And so why the cross? Because Jesus changes everything. Let's pray. King Jesus.